Good evening, friends in history, and thank you for tuning in. I hope that you can all hear me. As I mentioned, whenever I do one of these, it's sort of like um, being a teacher when you're going on a field trip and knowing you've called in for the bus and hoping it comes. So if you can let me know if you can hear me. Yes, Mrs. Longnecker knew what I was doing there. Oh, good. I have a former student in the audience, and I also have a screenshot of your thesis that I'm going to share, Duncan. Oh, nice. Ms. Peone, good to see you as well. Friends, um, in history from across the country and different parts of my life, it's really very exciting. So tonight I'll be talking about things that I have done to try to teach the age of revolutions more equitably. And there's a lot of aspiration in what I prepared, meaning for myself, it's there's things that um, I need to learn more about or I want to learn more about and things that I'm doing differently. Um, in my on-level world history class, I started doing the Age of Revolutions today. And then in my AP class, I won't be doing it for a bit. So I know I saw Lucia's uh, question there in the, in the chat. And I scheduled this for this time with sort of with teachers in mind um, who might be planning this unit like coming up. But I'm also aware, like doing this work with Fiveable, that with students who are on accelerated schedules, um, people who are doing this class in one semester, that happens, um, doing the AP World History class, there's people who are already into this content. So Mr. Laster last night did a session overviewing and reviewing, depending on where students were, um, this content. So to um so that's all a way of saying if you're a student and you haven't covered this yet it'd be a preview it'll be this will be pretty high level but there's some ambitious students out there who i know will get something out of thinking about um these topics at a deeper level and if you are a um a teacher you may not have covered this yet but the idea is to kind of start thinking about it before we get into the um the day-to-day -day of oh my gosh you know what am i doing tomorrow what am i doing this week that kind of thing so in my, so if you could fill out in the poll, there's a few different poll questions there. I'll take a peek. We have that, right? So a few people have chimed in and then, oh, nice spread on the different things that we're, we're looking for. So I'm gonna make myself even smaller, although I did wanna show I got my fiveable pin. We don't have fiveable cardigans yet. Um, I think Duncan might actually even recognize this particular sweater since I think it's about the same age as you are, um, 1997. Um, I also have the painting of Toussaint Louverture that a student gave me a few years ago, which along with the camel saddle, some students gave me um, a year um, prior to that. There's that. Yeah, I know. How can we make this happen? So today is a kindness uh, cardigan day, and so I'm fully prepared for that. Plus, it's cold here now. So I'm going to make myself even smaller. Like I said, the kids taught me how to do this. That you have those three options there. And then I'll take a look at some things. And this is meant to be, you know, I really want this to be highly interactive. So, I mean, any questions, comments, um, you know, that's all good. So we're team fiveable here. Some of you have been to a few streams. Some of you are streamers. And so what we do is we offer free live reviews for students in 15 different AP subjects. Um, I'm the lead AP world teacher. And so I do a lot of coordinating and scheduling and I review people's slides. And I, I watch a lot of streams myself, which I really enjoy. I've learned tons watching other people. Like every person I watch, I learn something from. So what I do. Um, but then I also do one of these a month. So if you find this interesting, I'm going to be tackling industrialization a month from now. Um, the same basic theme. And you can follow us on all the socials there. So here's what we have coming up over the next um, few days. We also have um, Melissa in the chat here will be doing one, another LEQ long essay question session. So the next two are student led, sort of the opposite of this, students talking to students, whereas here we have students and teachers. Although again, if you're a student, I would stick around and see, because these revolutions are very interesting. And then we have the um, 
Evan doing continuity and change over time. So kind of wrapping up what's the new unit for in the AP, the new AP world um, packaging. So that's the uh, there. And a lot of students seem to be, that's a pretty common place, I think, for people to be is finishing up that early modern period. And then, like I said, I'll be doing this again that time. So if this is your um, first stream, though, you might notice there's an ask a question thing. Although with the smaller number, um, you know, with 18, um, you could certainly just put the question in the chat. Or if it doesn't seem to be quite the right time, you could put it in ask a question. That kind of parks it. And there is a poll, as I mentioned. Then the call to action button goes to the resource section of a blog post that I wrote um, that's kind of laying out some resources. And I'll be updating that. And I also posted something today, uh, for those of you who've read my, my musings, and uh, that's kind of, that's on the same topic. So you may or may not be that interesting, of course. So this is who I am. Um, this is my 30th year teaching. And I've taught AP history for about half that time. I've been an AP reader six times. And then this is kind of what I've decided to do with the later part of my career is work on ways to make uh, world history more global and more equitable. And I use this word decolonizing. Um, and I, I know that word is problematic. You know, as I mean, honestly, like as a white teacher, there's part of me that knows I need to be careful about not just reaching for the strongest word, you know, to show, you know, that I'm fully committed. Um, and that's important because for indigenous people in, you know, where we, like where I live, decolonization has a literal meaning. Um, in world history, I view this as a way that the, the, the Western civilization curriculum that has existed, that a lot of us grew up with, has colonized the, um, has colonized world history. And so we need to kind of remove that sort of legacy um, colonial imprint from the course, even though we should still teach European things, but removing that European framing. So that's really what I mean is removing those legacy practices. Um, and we'll kind of see, and I am I'm open to pushback and I'm increasingly rethinking whether or not decolonizing is the best term for that, but that's what we have now. That's what I have now. So here's what I'd like to do. Ooh, looks like I hit that twice. So I like to set out when I do sessions like this aspirations, um, as I said, because it's not really a learning target. There's not going to be any measurement, but just so you know, this is what I'm thinking. And these are the four things I've laid out. But again, very, I'm going to stop talking here in a minute because I very much want people to kind of contribute their thoughts and use this as a way to exchange ideas. So with that in mind, I am curious, and I can bring people on screen too, although. One person I offered that to on in another communication I declined. So no worries. If you wanted to talk, I can do that. But if people wouldn't mind just taking a moment and what are some things you remember about your own learning about this material, whether that's in high school or in college? What kinds of things were emphasized? What topics came up? You know, we think in AP world in terms of there being four big revolutions. Um, you know, did you get into all those or some more than others? A lot of source work. Like, were you looking at primary sources? Were you mostly being explained? You know, having things explained to you. Or if you're a student, you know, what do you anticipate happening? Yeah, there's that's um, Melissa's comment there is kind of one of two ways that I've found that people experience world history and even my own teaching of it, either excessively modern focused or kind of ancient. I know when I student taught world history, which I started doing a month before the Berlin Wall came down, give you some sense of time. Um, yeah, I, sp I think I spent six weeks. I was just doing what was being done there at this school, six weeks on Rome, I am sure. So then, yeah, I don't really actually remember learning much about 
um, these revolutions. So then as teachers, if that's the case, and different people might, feel free to chime in with other experiences. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, you're right about that, Duncan. In general, yes. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is an area for growth. And so the fact that, you know, as a young, you know, younger person than myself, that you did have that experience with Haiti, that is, that is really an area where the class has grown. And I think most, especially AP world, people are going to talk about Haiti. So I want to talk a little bit about what I see, and I and I, again, people should chime in and correct me or tell me how your experiences are different. But what I see is this sort of legacy curriculum that exists in this topic. And when I talk about this, it's really based on my experiences teaching um, in two fairly large school districts for, like I said, 30 years. So I've been in a, a lot of curriculum meetings, and I've been to state conferences and national conferences and local conferences. I've been in, you know, a multitude of department and now, you know, professional learning community kinds of things. So it's really kind of just based on my experiences there of hearing other teachers talk about world history and, you know, the Facebook page, Twitter, all these different things. So this is kind of, this is what I see with that. And again, whatever observations you have you can toss in there. And that is even if the things like Haiti or the Latin American revolutions get covered, they're often viewed as derivative of the American and French revolutions. Like that's how they're understood. Again, this isn't always, but this is what like I see as the legacy, like what I'm trying to work against or restructure. And I think some of this comes from something I talked about in my last session like this, and I, I talk about a lot. And that is that there's a trap of causality when teachers are explaining history. And I think that kind of comes, I think that has um, both a pedagogic origin, meaning people want to explain things. And so they want the story, they want to be the narrative that students can understand. Um, and I think that especially relates to this idea of the enlightenment, which is clearly part of the story and something that, that should be discussed in a world history class, but I think it's a trap to view it as causation. Right, yes, yeah, no, I agree, Melissa, um, because the kids are trying to make meaning out of it too, and so there's, some of it's gonna be inevitable since we're working with novices and we're generalists. Um, so, you know, as a world history teacher, you know, I know a little bit about a lot of things and the students are brand new to the topic. So it's really, we don't want to be too hard on ourselves, but it's also, I think, important to, you know, kind of say it's complicated. That's the thing I posted this afternoon. And then this is another thing that, that really struck me from a professional development session we did. Uh, Keith Mays is an African-American studies professor here in Minnesota. University of Minnesota, and he's also a consultant consulting with our district on infusing more African, African American content into our social studies classes. And he's great. He's a very good speaker. And um, he gave a kind of keynote a couple years ago. And one of the things he said, like historically looking at social studies, is that the whiteness of the social studies curriculum is based on conversations that are certain in tone and so you see this like whenever i hear and i've heard these you know whenever you hear some when i hear something like well if we don't teach the renaissance they'll never understand parliamentary democracy or if we don't teach this they'll never understand that i see that as that kind of certainty now that kind of certainty can be focused on multiculturalism except that could be and you know every now and then i've been in that conversation too but mostly it's not and mostly this kind of emphasis on causality is all about the idea that we have to cover certain things in order for other things to be understood. And that's really very much from the teacher perspective because it's all pretty fuzzy to most students. So I think those are areas where we just need to be wary of causality. Of course, cause and effect is important, but we can't let that run everything. 
Any thoughts, other thoughts on that? People disagree, you know, I'm prone to my own gross generalizations too, for sure. And so I think the issue then in terms of how this gets reflected, because I think all four of those revolutions do get covered in most world history classes to some degree. But the issue really becomes one of granularity. And what I mean by that, or what's kind of meant by that, is what level of detail do people go into when they're talking about different things? And so what will happen then is that teachers, and so for those of you who are students out there, you can watch for this with the topics that you cover in class. You can kind of watch for, are there topics where your teacher or your book go into more detail about the course of events? So I'm going to assume that everybody taking world history is going to touch on these revolutions. And that's progress, because I certainly didn't learn about the Haitian Revolution at all until college. Um, and so that's great. Then the question becomes, are the different revolutions being taught with the same, same level of detail? So for students, what I was saying is you can notice that. And then, of course, sometimes there needs to be case studies. But the question then becomes, are there patterns to that? And so I would say that our goal as teachers, for teachers in the group, is to treat different parts of the world with, with the same degree of specificity overall, knowing that sometimes you're gonna do deeper dives into different areas, and so sometimes you'd be more specific about some things than others. So, I lost my, I'm in a presenter mode here. So this is what, what we mean, you know, how many. And then what that will come down to often is the notion that some things are more significant than others. And that's where I kind of want to push back. Now, the French Revolution is clearly a significant event. Sometimes people will argue that some things from European history, like the legacy Western Civ curriculum, are super significant, when I think you can make a case that they're really not. So that's come up sometimes with the Italian Renaissance or the Reformation. But these are interesting, but maybe not globally significant, or at least not more globally significant than other similar things, like the Sunni Shiite split or the, you know, renaissances in Central Asia, you know, the Timurid Renaissance. There's a lot of renaissances out there. But here, I think you can really say, well, the French Revolution, that is important. But the question then is, does it require more explication? Do we need to go more in detail in it than we do with other things? And I'm going to argue. No, even though we should still cover it. And I think one of the reasons is, it's like that joke about, um, there's a joke about the guy who loses his keys. Can't really tell this joke in a funny way. Plus the lag makes jokes hard with the video here. But you know, where the guy's looking for his keys and he's not, he's looking underneath the street light when he really lost the keys somewhere else. And it's like, well, I'm looking here because the light's better. With the French Revolution, we have so many different, um, different documents. Um, we have so many different documents that we can look at, including paintings like Jacques-Louis David. Here you have like a great painter who is actually at this historical event. Like it's a super tempting, um, it's a super tempting detail. Oh no, come on in. Donald is already streamed and now he's in here now. Sorry, I could only watch a little bit of yours because I was getting ready for this but we're here so right looking at uh duncan's coming up here yeah right yes and i think that's i that's really that's really kind of it isn't it duncan and i think no no worries we'll have that in there we'll um kind of come that'll kind of come back through here and i also understand what melissa's saying that this sense to do things chronologically um, right, and that, that does make some sense because we want to help kids keep some things in order. Um, so I don't, I'm going to recommend starting with Haiti. That's one of my recommendations, but I think we can make a very logical case for starting with France, um, and it's important. But then the danger is what can happen is if we feel like that revolution needs more detail, then we don't, we run out of time. And so it's really having that discipline to kind of, Look at the like. Look at the big ideas, and 
as as Duncan's saying, like look at the local conditions in each of these spots. And so I have a couple of things here just sort of for your consideration. And I think they're um, sources or things that people have seen. So this is from, um, oh, let me put that down there. Yep, Laurent Dubois, who was one of the big uh, Haitian revolutionary historians in the United States. And he wrote this essay that's on uh, Aeon. It's very Googleable. And I think, I think a chunk of it could be used in class. Like, I think this could be a short answer question stimulus. Where kids would, you know, corroborate and challenge what's happening. Yeah, I haven't used it in class yet. Um, mm, last year I did, uh, I'll kind of share what I did. Last year I did uh, an online discussion and this was one of the available resources. So some kids did use it, but we didn't, I haven't used it like where everyone reads it and we sit around in a circle and talk about it like that. And it does really do that historiography thing. Plus Dubois' cartoon that he did of the Haitian revolution that's at the nib. That's really great too. So I had my kids look at that. So I think you can argue, so you could make the case that the Haitian revolution would be the keynote because it's the most profound, like it has the most profound changes. Um, so there's that. And then I've recently become more aware of this idea through Duncan and then um, who's in the chat here and my former student who recommended the book on the right to me and then in, uh, a history podcast, um, Historias, from the Southeast Council of Latin American Studies. It's a great little podcast on Latin American history, or Latin American studies, so sometimes it's um, current events, which can be useful. Um, the book got recommended again, um, so I came across three recommendations, so I, I read it. And what um, Sanders' argument is in this book is that the Latin American revolutions in the mid the Latin American republics in the mid 19th century were at the leading edge of actual republicanism. Um, because you know, popular participation, they eliminated slavery, there was kind of universal male participation ahead of some other places. So you could really argue that they were at the leading edge and and, and saw themselves as being at the leading edge of, of democracy in the world, which is different than how when we look at the French Revolution as the ideal, then everything else gets compared to that. Um, as Laurent Dubois has said, though, the thing with the French Revolution is it means so many different things, of course. I think this is just an interesting idea um, that I, this is one of those things that I haven't really, that I haven't developed um, that much, I haven't developed yet as much as I would like to. So I think that's, you make that argument there. All right, so what is happening then? How does all this fit into AP World History Modern? So just to take a kind of a detour, and for the students, this is a little look behind the hood at what's going on. Yeah, I don't know. I'd be interested what people think about um, Brinton. Um, I think that's a way for kids to get an understanding of things. I don't know how well it works for some of these other revolutions in other places, so people can chime in on that in the chat there. So in the new AP World History Modern, we are um, we we have some opportunities and some gaps, and I've done this with the other things. So this is just taking a, a like I said, a look behind the curtain at this course. So revolutions is one of the nine units. So that creates some real space for talking about these things. But unfortunately, for this 1750 to 1900 period, it's like almost all industrialization, like the topics and everything. So I don't know if that's going to be, um, that's, I don't know if that's going to be reflected um, on the test or not. So really, I'm not going to teach. Industrialization is obviously important. <laughs> I mean, I'll teach industrialization, but when you, I'm going to show you something in a second here. So then, the the barrier that we face with this 
the way the, the new curriculum came out is that all four of these revolutions are in just one of the 93 learning objectives. Um, whereas there's like nine for industrialization. So that's that's tough. And that really is part of why I, I kind of did this stream to give people some ways to think about doing this unit in a way that doesn't isn't just one day in the French Revolution and then a couple days kind of rushing through everything else, and then you move on. Um, this is hard to see on this screen, I know, but a number of you have seen this on my blog. This summer in an act, which I'm still undecided if it was um, emotionally healthy or unhealthy, my eight-year-old and I cut up the uh, new course outline. And I did that just to kind of see how stuff would fit into the old frame. So on the left there, that's revolutions. Um, and the first one is in the Enlightenment, basically. And then the second one is everything else, all the political revolutions. Then in the middle, that big mass in the middle is industrialization. And on the right there is imperialism. So you can kind of see the issue that we have here is that, well, certainly we do need to cover that stuff in the middle. I think that's way out of balance. Questions and comments are rolling right along in the chat, but feel free to throw anything else in. So that's kind of what I see as the challenge here is to you know stretch out that revolution's learning objective in a way that includes a number of places around the world. Okay. So I have a couple thoughts on that. And the first one is to start the unit somewhere besides France. Yeah, I think so. I think some of my counting, just responding to Melissa's comment there, some of my counting when this thing first came out and I was angry, I'm um, still are kind of going through these different stages of dealing with it. I was like, oh my gosh, just counting these different things. But then when I've looked at them more closely as part of the fiveable work and just in my own class, it's like, oh, a lot of these things do kind of recur. Um, so, right. But it's just a way to kind of, I just don't want to fall into that. Just another warning about taking that document too literally. There's good stuff in there, good suggestions, but you know you need to manage it. So this is from Bram Hubble, legend, um, and he wrote this on liberating narratives, and I think it's well worth a read. It's one of the things that um, I have linked in my resources. And so uh, this discussion was kind of happening on Twitter. Last year, and of course, has happened in other spaces, other times. And then what Bram's intervention was, was to start and do a deeper dive into Tupac Amaru. Now, he's one of the people who world history happens over two years. So they have the whole year, 1300 to the present, because the kids do a whole year before 1300, the year before. New York living. Sounds terrific. That part of it. So just know not everyone can do all the different topics that some of these uh, New York and Massachusetts teachers do. But I think it's an interesting way to think about bringing this revolution into it because Tupac Amaru is essentially rebelling against the Enlightenment for tradition. And kind of getting back to what Duncan was saying about local conditions, like the it's not everything is an idea, everything is an ideology. I think another interesting thing about spending a little bit of time with, with this rebellion is that it allows connections to other similar things. So you can you could kind of branch out from there or compare or do some kind of thing with stations or kids jigsawing or, or students could compare with each other, looking at other indigenous rebellions against empire. So then the theme becomes not so much like rights discourse, but resistance to, to imperial encroachment. The Tupac Amaro re rebellion, um, his, his wife, but much more than his wife, got a co-conspirator and leader of this revolution, a national hero in Peru, is a figure in her own right, um, Michaela Bastidas. And so then that's kind of another bonus as I see it. Um, 
because we sometimes, we need to take those opportunities we can in the world history class. And this picture I got from the Spanish Wikipedia, and it's like from a commemoration of the 150th anniversary of Peruvian independence. So that's one possibility, I think. You start with the Tupac Amaro Revolution. That's also before the French Revolution. Uh, I mean, I've learned a lot about that over the last year. So if you're for teachers, or, and certainly students, if you're not sure what that is, for students, this was a rebellion of led by native people up in the Andes in Peru against changes in the colonial tax system and administration. So, yeah. So I don't, with the Tupac Amaru, well, I think part of that is, I think there's a couple things. It comes first, so kind of like Melissa was saying. So it's like 1780. Um, so it's in between the French Revolution or the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. But then there's also the, the way that Tupac Amaru like adopted this Inca identity. Um, and that's naming himself Tupac Amaru. And so I think it's just become like sort of this emblem for native Peruvians today. Um, but I don't know much about that rebellion. So that is today I learned, I need to learn about that rebellion. So if you have any good resources or links, if you could drop them in the chat, like a book or blog post or something, Duncan, that'd be awesome. I think um, centering Haiti has some other um, opportunities to it. Oh, um, okay, for the other one. Um, one is you can do the same thing like with the indigenous rebellions, um, and then you can connect to other slave rebellions, which don't quite become full on revolutions in, in most cases, but just to kind of highlight that's what's happening um, across those, those other places. So I think that's, I think that's cool. And then these are some questions. I was just talking about this with um, a teacher from California, Kelly Arjan, and and she had been in a discussion with a professor, local, you know, higher ed person, and they were talking about this. And it just really the Haitian Revolution is just so interesting and raises all these questions. So I think kind of going off of the um, essay from Dubois, like if you talk about that, like you're gonna wind up talking about France. It's not like, it's a lot like looking at resistance to imperialism the way I see it. If you start with resistance, you will talk about imperialism and imperial you know, aspects of colonialism, even motivations. Um, but if you start the other way, you won't necessarily get to resistance. So here, it's like if you start with the Haitian Revolution, you're going to wind up talking about France because you kind of have to um, because it's a big part of it. And, um, I mean, this is this is a brilliant, beautiful book. Ada Ferrer's Freedom's Mirror, which is actually about Cuba during the age of revolutions and, or after the Haitian Revolution. And I just, I can't recommend that book enough. And I learned a lot about the Haitian Revolution reading that. And I also learned that I knew very little about Cuba that didn't happen in 1898 or, um, you know, 1959, 1960. But if you look at this, this is this story, and then you can read how she describes it. There's also a story that she relates that she footnotes to Dubois and another scholar, who I can't remember right now, but there's a apparently in um, Caribbean history circles, a common story of a Haitian revolutionary who's captured and in his pocket, he has gunpowder, an African talisman and a copy of the rights of man, kind of bringing these sort of things together. Kind of again showing that it's not it's both it's the local and the and the international the ideological and the material yeah so i think those are two good reasons to start there and then kind of work work our way 
you know, kind of back to the other things. Because whatever you do in this unit, you're going to wind up working your way back to something else. If you take the French Revolution, it's really hard to do everything like completely contemporaneously because there's a lot of things happening in 1798, like a lot. So, and in a world history class where we're kind of dealing more thematically, I think those are reasons to kind of at least think about that. We are welcome people as if some people are coming in too. There's got a little poll here and I see where people are at. Well, we do have one person who's into the modern period. I think the second thing that I've tried to do that's difficult because of time and where you are um, trying to summarize things, but and I, I tried to do it last year and the evidence is that I didn't do a very good job. Like my, by the evidence, I mean the things that kids wound up writing. Um, based on what I'd said in class and then what they'd read in the textbook. But that is to try to complicate the idea of the Enlightenment. And this comes back to something that um, I wrote about this summer and all this in a post I called, It's Not AP Euro. Um, and that is, and it's also from conversations that I've had with, with students too, is that like the AP Euro book, it's going to, um, ooh, nice. I like that. Thank you, Duncan. And I know that um, Bolivar took shelter in Haiti at some point also. So you do have those connections. So Haiti can be seen as this other kind of thing. But as, um, and as actually a conversation that I had with Duncan about like in European history, the topic, the, the European history that exists in Eurocentric world history is not very good European history. And so it's not so much that there's too much European history in like a Eurocentric world history class, it's that it's not really state-of-the-art world uh, European history. So with the en Enlightenment, um, yeah, he was a rascal, <laughs> Mr. Little. Good to see you, Evan. Thanks for coming in. Um, you know, the summer before I taught European history, AP Europe for the first time, 15 years ago, I was at a workshop, one of the best workshops I've ever been to, AP Summer Institute fabulous teacher and a fabulous professor collaborating it's great and um, the professor especially was intellectual history and so she did a couple days of short lectures or a couple short lectures on the enlightenment and it's really like wow okay so all the kind of complications of the enlightenment the way enlightenment people viewed people outside of europe the way enlightenment um led to some negative things also positive things it was very complex it was really interesting and and so then, when you see this very simplistic idea of the Enlightenment in world history classes sometimes, um, and I get that sometimes we're going very quickly, and so sometimes that's the best you can do. That said, this is one of my goals, is for kids to have a more complex of understanding of what this means. And part of this comes from another book that I know a lot of people have read but that's something that stuck with me that I'm trying to emphasize more in my classes this year as I frame things is the idea, you know, these three, three notions from world historian Robert Marx. And this is coming back to that idea of not getting trapped into simple ideas of causation that without some coincidence, you know, con conjuncture, two things happening at the same time, that then we wouldn't have these kind of things. So if we take a look at this map here, this is the map that Bram uh, Hubble shared on Twitter, and I'm sure people have seen things similar. You can see all these different slave revolts, rebellions over this 350 year period. And the enlightenment, you know, was only a kind of a thing for a part of that period. So really it's kind of the conjuncture of the big slave rebellion in Haiti with the Haitian revolution. And then just to kind of clip through just a couple other things about how this is more complicated, because what happens is a lot of times people, like students, and I mean students, and this is from the textbook, or things I've said, or a combination, or their US history classes, they'll use the Enlightenment, you know, capital T, Enlightenment. They'll, they'll use that like as a synonym for freedom, 
for for um, social contract theory. But if you kind of look, I mean, if you look closely, it does, that doesn't really hold up. So like Edmund Burke, is he enlightened? But he's against the French Revolution, but he's also more liberal than, because he's a parliamentary official from Britain, than people in other parts of Europe, like Rousseau. Like, what do you do with Rousseau? Um, so a lot, and he's the thinker who most contributed to the French Revolution. Um, and his ideas are often better construed as romantic. So I guess here'd be a way to put it. With, here's a way I'm going to try to put it with students. Is that enlightenment was about this kind of idea of rational discourse. And as a result of that, people argued all the time. So I think with our students, we don't always have to convince them. They don't have to understand all the complications to know that things are complicated. So they don't have to know all the ins and outs of all these different Enlightenment thinkers to understand that they disagreed with each other and there's more going on than just Enlightenment. And some of this is something that French revolutionaries themselves did. The image on the left shows Voltaire and Rousseau walking toward a Hall of Fame together. It's a French revolutionary era image. So kind of saying that they were heirs. These men were both dead. I think they died like really close to each other, kind of like in Jefferson Adams thing. Um, and they're being, you know, so they're trying to say that the revolution's an heir to both these things. But in real life, they had a really prickly relationship. So like two humans with tremendous egos. And so here you see like Voltaire, like making fun of Rousseau. Just one thing I found and all kinds of stuff out there like that. I don't recommend it all going through all these names with students. You know, I think if students know these two names and basically how they contribute to the revolutions, that's fine. But I think we can also tell students that it's comp that it's complicated. And it's not just the Enlightenment. And Enlightenment doesn't just mean one thing. It means a way of thinking. And then I think it's also important to structure our classes around the idea that Enlightenment means all these different things. So when you, you know, you study European history, the, um, ooh, I don't know that reference, the Shadow of the Enlightenment, Evan. Can you uh, explain what you mean there? I mean, I'm down with the dark side of it. Oh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too focused. <laughs> right. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. The other side, that's what um, Dr. Ottaway called her lecture on this. You have the other side of the Enlightenment, you know, scientific racism. Stuff like that. So um, in Cuba, like the slave driven, sugar economy was very much a part of enlightened era reforms, trying to make government more efficient, more rational. You know, Catherine the Great considered herself enlightened. Frederick the Great thought he was enlightened. You know, these, these people are absolutists. So enlightenment doesn't just mean, you know, social contract theory. Of course, it does mean that. But it also contributed to entrenching slavery. And this is an area where that Freedom's Mirror book really kind of taught me a lot about how the sugar economy of Cuba was really was planned out. Like people specifically endeavored to make Cuba a sugar colony. And they saw what they were doing is, you know, they're rationalizing the legal code so that it could support slavery and property ownership. It was very much, you know, in tune with these other uh, enlightened things. So again, this is not necessarily detail that I'm planning to go into with all my students, um, but I think it is worthwhile for them to know that these kind of, that ideas have all different kinds of effects, and what happens with the ideas is contingent on other kind of material conditions. The reason this is so important to me is that I don't want my students who aren't from Europe, my students of color. I don't want them thinking that people who look like them only knew they should fight for their freedom and rights because of some papers that people in Paris wrote down. I, I just, I just won't abide that um, because it's not true. It's not, you know, like you look at the Haitian Revolution. I mean, the more you get into it, the first, the first documented instance of a Haitian. Um, Oh, yeah, that's true. 
the first um, example like of uh, the um, Haitian revolutionary in possession of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, obviously like dock workers and stuff get a hold of them like right away, but like revolutionaries up in the hills, like they get them because they're fighting soldiers representing the revolutionary government. So that they're taking them away from them. There's Haitian um, rebel bands that pledge allegiance to the King of France because they're opposed to the revolutionary government because the revolutionary government for a time was still enforcing slavery. So yes, I, I agree that this, this could be a way to do complexity with students um, as well. And so again, I want to be down on people, especially people teaching the class with younger students. But a lot of times, you know, you see like in certain online spaces, um, people talking about like these like very straightforward causal relationships they're trying to get their students to memorize. And then, and then also maybe later on in the year complaining that they're not getting points for complexity. So, and I think honestly, some ninth graders might not be able to do complexity. You know, it's a lot just to be able to get the basic thing down. Uh huh. Right. Exactly. So here we have Bolivar. Who's you know is he a revolutionary or not? And I think we already do some of this. Like I do think there's a lot of this going on out there where you're like, hey, um, how, excuse me, how, um, you know, some people are radical, um, but not radical in other ways. And what does that mean? So here's another slide that might be able to do that. Again, to look at how the Enlightenment's presented differently in European history. I was actually a reader for this prompt on the lower left. It's a total mess of a question. It's the worst experience I had at the reading in terms of like the actual reading part. Because there's so many parts to that question. But it does show you how this is, was one of the main ideas of that, you know, and what they were looking for. And the answer, which very few kids came up with, was like romanticism. But if we look at these other people, that's a great non-contemporary image of Tupac Amaru that I saw when I was doing my image search on t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. And that's back when we those were holistically graded and they really wanted the FRQs to be holistically graded. But it was like, I couldn't do it. You know, like some of the, you know, the history grad students and, you know, professors you know they can they could read better than the likes of me but you know i had to make like a little table like tally sheet you know because they were like did they do all the parts or not so well but it does show you that this is how ap this is how european historians understand that the french revolution challenges the enlightenment by bringing these new romantic uh, you know it also does things you know it does both right it's complexity it does both Right, right, right. Yeah, so if we, is ended right before 1848, and that's one of the things I'm trying to think about, you know, we are pressed for time, but how can we push through into 1848? And really that book, you know, the Sanders book, um, Vanguard of the Atlantic Revolution, the thing that was really interesting for me in there was like the Latin American 1848 stuff. I mean, that was one of the things that was interesting. So kind of keeping that going. And the Age of Revolutions blog, which has great little like 10 to 15 minute read posts by academics, really recommend that. They really take a pretty broad view of the Age of Revolutions. Okay, but what I'm getting at here on this slide here is this, right? Tupac Amaru is rebelling against um, kind of enlightenment sort of reforms, right? And so I think really, the, I, I guess the two things I would say, I really, I really like what um, I'm just going to adopt straight on what Melissa said about complexity. And then I would also add that I think we're much better off offering enlightenment as the context for what's happened. So that these reforms, it's not like the monarchs instituting those reforms were like super into being enlightened. It's like they wanted to maximize revenue using rationality as a tool. And if you look at people like Bolivar, you know, as Evan's pointing out, he's not universally committed to equality, but he's using these enlightenment terms and phrases and social contract language to accomplish his goal. 
So one of my broader projects with students is to have them consider people's material interests as affecting their ideas, that ideas are sometimes a trailing kind of indicate trailing kind of indicator. But I think if we think of it as enlightenment in this context, so then when Haitian revolutionaries decide they want to form their own state in an Atlantic environment with this kind of language going on, well, they use that language to try to accomplish their goals. It's not like they needed that language to know that they wanted to be free. That seems absurd. So we want, um, you know, want the student the, the kind of thing, but the alignment's still clearly context. It's like, it's not like, it's not, it's, it's something that's happening. Um, so that's how, you know, I'm going to try to approach it. And plus context is hard. So if we look at this idea, you know, if we can teach complexity and context with it, well, then we're really kind of, kind of doing something here. So then this would become an organizing question for a few days of study where students could kind of play around with this. And I tried it last year with limited success, but now this year with a little, a few more days, that's a good thing about these changes, a few more days, and we'll kind of dig into it a little bit. I'm just gonna always put this slide <laughs> in, in all my things like this. Right, I don't know, that I, you know, I don't know everything. I'm, All right. So then the the third thing that'll be shorter, I know. Um, the third thing to do, I think, with this is to is to consider something outside of these big four and and bring it in. So these are some resources. Um, one of which I've mentioned. Um, I really like that that podcast, and I think the Dig podcasts are good for recommending to students because there's transcripts of all of them, so it's accessible. Um, for students who might not be especially auditory or, or might be impaired with hearing in some way or only want to look at part of it. And it's good because it gives a really good crystallization of the Haitian Revolution, which is hard to do. And it also talks about other revolutions. And the it's four women, they're sassy and fun. Um, there's two who do any podcast. So Dig is one of my favorite podcasts. And then this book I read last year when it came out. Um, and it looks, and those are just short essays, so you could probably adapt some of those for students too, and looking at these different indigenous rebellions. So these are three places where I got some of the ideas that are on the next slide and resources, and they're linked if you follow the big green button. So I had students do an online discussion where their initial post was supposed to be comparing one of the main revolutions with one of the other revolutions, and there were resources there. A few people selected the West African revolutions is what they'd like to know more about, and that they're most interested in. That would be me too. I've only done a little bit, but there was um, resistance to colonialism, essentially, organized by um, Islamic leaders or leaders using Islam for religion. Um, yeah, I think it is, it is a caliphate, may or may not be that one, Evan. But they did call it jihad and using Islam as legitimating, motivating um, force to try to, uh, to resist colonialism in West Africa. So what the kids could do who brought that in, even if they just understood the broad outlines of it, is then they can make some comparisons to other people who are trying to preserve tradition in some way. And you can look at elements in all these revolutions where people are trying to preserve tradition or where they're trying to push back against tradition. So there is a link there. And it would be something I would like to know more about. So if you, yeah, so if you have a resource on the, the Sokoto Caliphate, man, just draw, that'd be great. I'd love to see it. There. And so then this would be the kind of the project, if you will was that I had students do an online discussion, which is something I do in my classes. And we, there's another school in my district we're partnered with, so the kids had the discussion. So there's some kids in there who they don't know because they go to a different high school, and kids in the other classes. So it's a little bit of a 
more, you know, more higher level, or collegiate, not higher level, but you know, higher ed kind of thing where you don't necessarily know everybody. Um, and then that was the question they were kind of working on. Actually, I sort of buried the lead here. Was this was the organizing question for that? And so, depending on which revolutions they picked, then they would come off, you know, they would kind of come to different conclusions, like it's going to happen a lot in these kinds of situations. But kind of getting them to think outside that. So, to take um, the point from earlier of pushing an age of revolutions forward, like into the 19th century, there's that. But then also, this is also kind of bringing it. I never know how to do this. Is that bringing it forward or pushing it back? I guess that'd be forward. Then also pushing it back to talk about like some of these earlier things because like Tacky's Rebellion and Pontiac, that's 1760. These West African revolutions though are later and about the same time, the same time period. So kind of looking at these other things um, as ways to see. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to click on that as soon as I'm done. So those are my thoughts with, with everything there. Right. If you haven't had a chance to look at the Haitian Declaration of Independence, which was recently on Earth, it's a great story, um, at like HaitianDOI.org. The historian who did it has like a Lego um, Desain in her um, Twitter bio. So enough said but that's a really good document to use too and its language is obviously pretty strong here for people to use so i would i'm open to any like questions or pushback or other ideas I urge people to check this out all right well i think i'll wrap up because we can continue to discuss and other kinds of forums. Um, certainly, I just published a post, so feel free to leave comments there. And I mean, like pushing back comments too, please, and um, online. And for those of us who are part of Team Fiveable in the Slack, and I'm really glad that people people came out. So yeah, right. There's always more to read. <laughs> um, I really, I'll. I guess of all those books, the Ferrar books, the best, it's the best written. So that's the, uh, <laughs> we, this, yeah. Oh man, thank you. Thank you. So just some ways to think about some things differently in order to create some more equitable space in our classrooms. So thank you all very much for coming out and look forward to seeing you uh, down the road. Good night.